Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the virtual breakfast sessions. I'm Larry Sashin. I'd like to thank you all for spending some time with us today. Um, we've got a very, very interesting and somewhat controversial topic to discuss today. So please, audience, get involved. All you have to do is text Fred, and Fred will either ask your question or if he thinks it's good enough, we'll bring you right into the conversation. Um, today's topic is uh, tension in the dining room. Is there something brewing there besides coffee? Uh, but before we go into that topic, I want to introduce everyone that's here. So Bree, why don't you start? Hi, my name is Bree Myers-Taxira. Um, I currently am the owner of Augustine Sula Maria uh, in Mamaroneck, um, 213 Halstead, um, right across from the, uh, the train station. Okay, thank you. And uh, Stephen. Hey guys, how are you? My name is Stephen Yen. I am the Food and Beverage Director and Executive Chef at Liberty National Golf Club. Um, this is my first time at a club, though. I came from, like, normal food service in New York City, just currently before this, running Tao downtown, um, but always high-volume restaurants like Catch and Tao and Morimoto. Yvonne, why don't you tell everybody who you are? And Yvonne has been in many of our shows. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Yvonne. Uh, I own uh, my kitchen. And uh, a series of events is basically an event hall in Forest Hills, New York City. Thank you, Fred. Good morning. I'm Fred Clashman. I'm the editor and publisher of Total Food Service. Looking forward to a great session. And once again, I'm Larry Sashin. And um, so the topic, um, what's brewing in the dining room besides coffee? You know, I guess it all started just before the pandemic when there started to be a slowdown in restaurants. And uh, the pandemic hit like a ton of bricks and everybody closed down and people came back. But um, what we heard back then was, I'm sorry, we're, we're, we're a few people short. And uh, what's developed since then is a different attitude with management. Management is scrapping and, and trying to grab every single dollar they can on a short staff. The, the labor itself has a different set of values now. Uh, where do you find professional waiters anymore? Where is that chain where a dishwasher became a runner and a runner became a waiter? That has all but disappeared. Um, and, and the diners, diners are suffering through um, their, their wages being shortened, curtailed. Dishes, everything is more expensive. Everything has shrunk, and in many cases, the service has slowed down. Brianne, you have basically two restaurants attached to each other by a hall, and oh. it's the same place, but it, in reality, you've got two different rooms going on with two different vibes with the same uh, menu, but you don't have a huge staff, but everything works like clockwork. How? <laughs> and you're mobbed on a Tuesday night. Um, I, I attribute that to having a wonderful kitchen um, that is able to function. Um, but I also, we, I think we spoke about this earlier today. Uh, we have a, a, a large vast of um, people who uh, our staff is at very, very different levels. Um, so we're looking at people who have uh, worked in the industry for 20 years. We have people who have worked in a pizzeria for two years. But at the end of the day, they all have good hearts and they all want to be there. And those are the, the people that you want to staff every single day. And we're willing to work with that and with, they're willing to work. And I think that our guests, I hope that our guests um, see that every single day and are forgiving um, and seeing what is happening when we're going through one dining room through the other. Um, and we'll get there one day. We're only, we're, we're 10 months old now, um, which is really uh, fantastic, but uh, 
yeah, we uh, we're thriving, which is wonderful, but we do struggle every single day with staffing and learning and education and teaching about food and wine. And uh, yeah, I, I spoke to you a lot about it the other day, so. Okay, thank you, thank you. Now we've got three different types of restaurant tours here. Steven, you're at a golf club, um, Liberty National. Um, you don't have people trying out the restaurant. They're all members. How are you dealing with this, with labor and, and everything that's going on right now? So I think, I mean, traditionally clubs, golf clubs and country clubs, you have, you have a, a couple different roles where you have like a houseman or a housewoman where for a couple hours, they could be serving lunch for a couple hours. They could be, you know, setting up the banquet hall. There's it's, it's one of those where it's not really one job title um, where they, you know, you, they wear many, many different hats, including myself. Um, so it is a little different. Plus at the same time, we don't have the volume to keep enough, full-time employees. So we have a core minimum group of servers, bartenders, cooks, and then definitely different staffing agencies that we'll have to bring in. For instance, a PGA tournament, or this year we're doing an LPGA tournament uh, for Mizuho. And that's going to be like the first week of June. So for that, I'll have to bring in three different staffing agencies just to be able to deal with the thousands of guests per day that obviously I couldn't be able to afford on payroll. Um, but you know, I think it's one of those things where my food runner is my bus boy is the same guy who comes in early and vacuums and sweeps the entire place. Who's, you know, he also, uh, for instance, all of our laundry is done in house, but we don't actually have one perfect, you know, person doing the laundry. It's normally one of the locker room attendants, you know, taking, taking a shift on the laundry. So it's, it's kind of, we we treat it more like a miniature cruise ship. You know, it's like a little world all within itself um, where at one moment you could be in the dining room and the next moment you could be downstairs putting away deliveries. Um, so I think it's, it's a model that in a perfect world you'd love to have in restaurants, but you know, it doesn't really exist. No, there's no such thing as a perfect world, but that's really how we get along here. Um, having, you know, trying to cross train everyone as much as possible. Okay. Now we're on. Now, this is a third model we have here. Yvonne does, um, has a, a catering venue in Forest Hills. So how is it different than what you know, uh, Bree has said and Stephen has said? I mean, I think it's similar to what Stephen was saying. Um, and, and I guess Bree both. Um, so we're events only right now. And we, we're basically Friday through Sunday. That's most of the time but we do have the random events that we have on, on Monday, Wednesday. So we are, we're at the mercy most times of temporary work. You'll have a core team of people. Um, we are very lucky. We've had, we've been open for about two and a half years. Um, and we've had the same front of the house team, the core teams, like four people for two and a half years and they're students. So they're a little bit flexible. They work they, they go to school during the week and then they work with us on the weekend. Um, it becomes problematic, obviously, like what Stephen said, when you have the, 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 the surplus of events that you don't have enough uh, staff. But I'm, I'm also very lucky that I, I have a good network of friends and people in the industry. They're always looking to make a little extra cash. So you can you can hit them up and say, listen, you know, I have these events. You know, it's, it's also a group of like five to ten people that are you know, like culinary mercenaries that are always looking for extra work. Um, and they tend to fill those gaps in, but it, but like it was mentioned before, everybody wears a lot of different hats, including myself, like Stephen, and then uh, well, like everybody says, sometimes you're in the kitchen, sometimes you're front of the house, sometimes you you fill in whatever gaps you need. But we do encourage people, and you said that there wasn't necessarily like the same model as grabbing people that started as dishwashers and promote them to busboys, to servers, etc. We're kind of like that. Like we are very much like that. My cooks are the dishwashers and the dishwashers are my prep cooks. And the bartender also helps me set up the, the, like the buffet when we need, like we move people around 
and we show them that nobody's above anybody else. Nobody's below anybody else. This is a team effort. We're all in it for the guest. No matter who you are, you take out trash, you polish glass floor, you do anything that needs to be done at the end of the day. That's the way we handle it. I have so, you know, uh, knowing the three of you and seeing your operation and or talking to you over the years, uh, I know one thing, uh, I, I think the, the best way to work around staff problems is education education and i i know yvonne and i know steven and i'm i'm sure Bree does the same thing what is that regimen that that daily or weekly or whatever period of time that you sit down with people and actually instruct them make sure that they're up to date and they know how do you keep them up on things well larry can i jump in and just sure Go kind ahead. of That's not not uh not correct what you're saying but kind of enhance it a little bit I okay. think you're, you mean communication, like communication is above all, period. Like if people aren't being communicated with, when you have a, a staffing shortage, when you have change of plans, when all of a sudden you have to stay extra hours to carry out the trash because, you know, it's a holiday and everybody has to chip in, like communication above all in communication and leadership, I think is the most important thing. And then maybe education and training people to kind of be able to move up. But if you don't start with communication, you'll you'll always have a revolution because nobody nobody understands. Nobody knows what's happening. Never assume that people know no. what they're supposed to do. No. So, Bree, Bri, you're you're in constant movement during a service, and I see you talking to people and, and tables, people that are working. Build on this communication that that Yvonne just brought up. Listen, there's a. Uh... Like I said before, we're, we're dealing with various levels of people who don't know what things are. Um, so it's constantly an education. Um, we have a meeting every day, as I'm sure all of you do. Um, every day we sit down, we talk about food, we talk about uh, different wines, we talk about like whatever we can. Um, I bring wine people in, but every single day, the rule is if you don't know the answer, you don't lie. Like that's, pretty simple like if you don't know the answer the like at your table you say let me find out and let's learn together and we either go over together and we we speak about it or we talk about it in the back and they speak about it in the at the table but it's a constant um overflow of uh you know like we we have ramps on the menu right now a lot of people don't know what ramps are and uh and it's I light up when I talk about it, but not everybody knows what that is. So I want them to constantly learn more, to be excited to talk about this. Um, it's really simple, I think, like just to, to educate people every single day. We're all only moving forward if we're all learning, myself included, so. Okay, Steven. Oh, no, I you're, think, you're big on communication. Sure. I mean, it's um, so I guess I'll attack this from two ways. I was just telling one of my sous chefs that lately the way I the way I see myself is, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a coach, right? I'm a chef. I need to be able to coach my cooks and my staff through any situation, whether it's cooking or cleaning. Um, but the only difference is I'm, I'm still eligible to play. Right. So I can still get in the game if I need to. Um, but being, I'm really, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to get my sous chef to see the big picture. I want him to, you know, when I walk into my walk-ins and dry goods, I take mental snapshots. So I know where everything is. I, you know, I'm looking at the invoices, I'm making sure the products in house. So when the, you know, when the prep cooks like, Hey chef, we don't have the, the salary didn't come in. I'm like, yes, it did. It's on the third Metro shelf in the walk-in on the left, you know, and someone could look at me and be like, how the, how the hell did he know that? And it's one of those things of when I'm putting on my chef coat in the morning, I'm walking the entire space. So I know where everything is, how everything looks from the night before, you know, making sure everything is perfect, good to go. But being able to get my sous chefs to that large, because in their mind, they're coming in, they're like, okay, I have my prep list from yesterday. I know I got to get my stocks on. I know I have to get my sauces. I have to butcher. I have to fabricate meat later. And that's really, they just have blinders on. They're just really thinking about what they need to do. And then whoever's 
maybe they have a couple cooks underneath them to check their meats and floss, but they're not thinking of, oh, did the linens come in? You know, it is the garbage room, how's that looking? Does it need to get deep cleaned? You know, they're not thinking of the party next Thursday night or the bat mitzvah coming up. Um, so what, what I'm trying to get my sous chef to do is being able to, you know, see the big picture, macro manage, micro manage, but be able to zoom in, zoom out, zoom in, zoom out. Cause a lot of the, a lot of the entry level managers, they stay zoomed in, you know, they really stay zoomed in all the time. So being able to call them and bring them over and say, Hey, listen, I know you're working these projects today, but we really got to focus on what's coming up next week. Um, you know, it might rain the next two, three days, let's scale back on labor. But that, that means let's take advantage of the labor that we have in house today. We have, we have a full house. Let's get, let's get everyone motivated like a coach, you know, cause the thing is yelling and screaming doesn't work anymore. You really gotta, you know, you have to excite the team to be there, you know, and that could be anything from, like I said, we got 30 Yankees tickets for the staff yesterday night that the game that you were at and we just opened two weeks ago. So it's one of those like, Hey, welcome to, you know, 2023 season. We want to kick it off on the right foot. Um, you know, go enjoy yourself. We want to show that you can play hard. You can work hard. It's not one or the other, you know, it's, it's, it's a work life balance. But I think that constant communication and trying to get, um, personally, I'm trying to get all my managers to where I am, you know, where, meaning knowing where everything is and seeing, seeing the BEOs and, you know, taking care of the bottom line, making sure it doesn't creep up on us. Um, trying to communicate that as much as I can, because, you know, it's, I'm not a professor of business. I'm not a, I'm not a culinary professor, but that it, it's, that's really what my job is every single day is teaching and communicating. So trying okay. to try to communicate that. So we, we, we've been concentrating. Hey, Larry, hold on one second. Go ahead, Fred. Hey, I'm curious. Steven, what's the difference between being a, a coach and a boss? Um, well, that's, I mean, there's, there's multiple because I hate that word boss because for me, yep. a boss sits at the back and tells you what to do. You know, I like to lead from the front. Um, I'm yep. the first one to mop. I'm taking out trash. I'm fabricating. You know, I'm, I'm putting away deliveries. Um, so I think a coach is someone who, He's touched, he's felt, he's, you know, he's ran the plays because he designed the plays. So I think that's the difference for me is having that coach who understands the players and also understands when, hey, you got to, you got to sit that. You, he might be your MVP, but you need him for the next game. You know, you, you can't let him burn out the, if it's a Friday night or you, you know, you have a huge event on Sunday coming up. You don't want your, you don't want your MVPs burning out. You know, I think that's the difference between a coach and a boss. A coach really understands the whole scenario and we'll use, you know, try to use the whole team and instead of just passing the ball to one guy every time. Rick, can you add to that? I think that, uh, I, I don't know the difference in my world. Um, I think what he was speaking about, like, you just always have to be the one who's willing to do. I would never ask anybody to do something that I'm not willing to do. And I think both a boss and a coach do that. Um, a coach might like get you through it and teach you how to do it. And a boss might be like, this is, do it. Coach is more of a, we're gonna do this together and you'll do it on your own the next time. And a boss is going to say, do this now. I don't, I don't consider myself a boss. Yeah, you're a teammate. It's part of a team. A coach player. is part of a team. The boss is the one who sits up at a, up above and points down at people. I, I got and, it. And, and, and the reason I asked the question was no. Brianne, Brianne hit on something that was interesting, which is this idea mm -hmm. of being comfortable enough in your own skin, especially in many cases as a minimum wage employee, to be able to say to a customer, I don't know the answer. I'm going to go, I'm going to go find out. That's a very tough scenario for somebody who's not comfortable doing it. Yeah. I, you know, yeah, I, I, I agree in all of this. We, we've been concentrating on working with your staff. There's a, a different kind of attitude. I feel it in some in some restaurants that I go into, and I'm sure other people who are listening to this feel the same thing. Um, 
we all have memories of the plates we got in, in 2019 and the prices. And we've gotten price increase after price increase after price increase. The chargers that we used to get on our, the big plates that we used to get on there and a plate full of food has now shrunk down to people, rest, many restaurants change their plates to make the portions look bigger. Um, so we've got shrinkflation, inflation, and short staffs waiting on people. How are you dealing with these diners who are now upset? <laughs> anybody i haven't actually encountered a lot of that but we're, we're we're new in the area so right they don't have a memory of what you what you were serving in 2019 what was um in the past so um yeah i mean you're getting a very, very you're getting a decent price for a plate of pasta and and and, and it's 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 a plate of pasta that people were spending four or five dollars less five years ago yet in your restaurant nobody seems to mind why i hope to think quality of what we're bringing um i mean everything is house made we it's a true farm to table um and and because we're new honestly um so what of you know one of the benefits of opening a restaurant recently is that we can we can come in saying this is the standard, this is what you should expect from quality food, versus or in and quality service and all of these things versus everybody else who may have to start worrying about upping their pricing and upping their like and now their payroll is increasing and things like that. So maybe, maybe that's the benefit of us opening in a pandemic, which there are very little benefits, to be honest. Um, but maybe that's something that, um, that we have that other people don't have to deal with. Yeah, and well, look, don't get me wrong. People come in and, and question our prices. Don't get me wrong. But at least I can say, this is what it is. Like, yeah, I, it's 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 and 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 when when Bree is talking about this, it was our anniversary a few weeks ago, and we went in on on a Tuesday night, and the place was packed on a Tuesday night. Uh, that's not. Everybody's been very kind. Yeah. That's 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 not the norm. It's not the norm. I I, I know, um, Stephen, you're working on another. You, you you still have limits to what you could put out. How are you dealing with rising prices? and keeping quality on, on the table when you? I mean, it's it's always tough. I have to keep a larger inventory than in normal restaurant just because, um, you know, our motto is always say yes. So we have some, we have some very, very high-end Japanese businessmen that are members. We have um, a lot of Italian members. We have, you know, Chinese members. We, we pretty much have the entire world. Um, so my inventory is around like 55,000 a week, which is what I used to run a Tao. And that's just to keep products because yes, we do have a menu, but if somebody wants a shrimp fra diavolo, they're getting a shrimp fra diavolo. You know, if somebody wants a veal milanese, they're having a beautiful double chop veal milanese. Um, if somebody wants general South chicken, I make them general South chicken, you know, um, as far as, the direct pricing, you know, I'm pretty transparent with my pricing with the members. It's, um, it's not as good as, you know, there's certain clubs where your, your goal is to break even, um, you know, most, a lot, I'd say 90% of country clubs actually take a loss in food and beverage and they'll make it up from events, actual a la carte food and beverage. I mean, you know, you'll make it up in events where weddings, bar mitzvahs, uh, et cetera. But we don't do any of that. We don't do we don't do weddings. We don't do bar mitzvahs. We don't. Um, that's not our style. We just want to be one of the best golf clubs um, and host tournaments. Um, 
But I think, you know, I, one of my first jobs ever, I worked for Zach Palaccio in a place called Fatty Q and somebody, somebody questioned the pricing of, and this is 2009, 2010. They said, why am I spending $16 on three ribs? Right. So thank God he was a good writer and he had some pulls. So he actually rebuttaled and did a full food cost plate cost analysis, which was published in the New York times on that $16 three piece rib dish. Um, and it was, it was literally, you know, we were using Berkshire pork with, it took us, it was about a three day brine. You know, we smoked it for until the internal temp was 225. So you're, you're just like a dry aged steak, your time value of that money and your, your actual product goes down. But you know, I, it, is it coming to people being fully transparent on their menus on food costs and plate costs? Like, I don't think it's going to ever going to be there. Cause you know, you can argue the same thing or even worse for fashion. You know, you can say this, this cotton costs this much and the labor costs this much. And I, you know, exactly, especially in fashion, as you know, um, it's that perception, that perceived value. Did you, did you give the customer or guest the perfect experience? Did, you know, was the food beautiful? Was it delicious? Was it hot? Was the server knowledgeable? Was the, you know, the manager touch the table? Was the music too loud? Were the light, you know, there's so many, there's so many variables that you need to make sure that the show is perfect. You know, if you, if you can't produce a good show, um, you know, I think that's a first, that's your first downfall. You know, I think a lot of people might come into the dining room already pre predetermined to either love you or hate you, depending on reviews. You know, it's, uh, for instance, if somebody, if a friend says, hey, did you watch that show on Netflix? And they tell me all about that show. I actually might not like the show because I now I know too much of it and I never really got to enjoy the show for what it was. And I think that's, you know, that's becoming well, a little too much. Uh, let's, let's take bad Roman, for instance, you know, I think it's the number one Instagrammed um, restaurant in the city, one of the hardest restaurants in the city to get into. And I went about two weeks ago and yeah, the food is good, but was it great? No, like, I don't, I don't think it's, it's never going to win, you know, three Michelin or James Beard, but it's, it's the show. It's the theatrics, you know, it belongs on Broadway and yeah. could, what was cats the best Broadway show in the history of, of theater? No, but it was one of the most highest grossing and, you know, it's a theatrics. So I think there's more variables to just good food, you know, it's the experience. It's the way it makes you feel um, <sighs> good food invokes memories, you know, is for an accuracy. Um, there's a lot more variables to it. So I think if you can leave, if you can, if the diner can leave happy, it's not just the food. It's, you know, it's the, the conversation they have with the owners, the conversation they have with the managers, you know, with, with, with everyone, it's the experience. You know, I think the conversation you had with Bree was definitely memorable enough to, to leave a mark on you that yes. you know, how are you going to foster this newfound relationship and it's only going to grow. And I think that's a huge part of it as well. And, if you don't have the time to have those conversations because of short staff and, and the labor shortage, that that's, what's really going to hurt, you know? Got it. Got it. Thank you. Yeah. So Yvonne, Yvonne, you, you were a few weeks back, you spoke about um, your job is to make dreams come true um, and how you're selling love and dreams. So Phyllis his cousin had a wedding at your place two years ago and she's getting married and she wants the same thing. And then you have to tell her what the price is when she's already looked at Phyllis's price. You've got a completely different set of problems there. How do you deal with that? Unmute, unmute. Okay. There so you. we, we encountered that all the time, to be honest. Uh, we, we mm -hmm. have, we have a lot of people that, like you said, you know, they'll, they'll have, uh, they'll have an event and their friend finds out about it. And then, you know, they want to have another party or they want to have something else. And we have, I mean, we're a living example of like price increase and kind of seeing your clientele change a little bit. Um, I think as far as breaking it, to people and saying, 
you know, this is what it's going to cost when you have a previous price is always difficult. Like anybody, if you're rich or poor, it doesn't matter. Everybody's is, is trying to get the best value that they can. Um, and we have, we were a living example, you know, when you hear like race, your prices raise your prices raise your prices and it's better to do less than well with at a higher price point than to do a lot so we did that we we literally increased prices because we we had to um and we've seen people turn away and say you know what unfortunately it's it's you know it's a little too much for me right now um but a lot of the people that we used to have that do parties with us again don't mind and are very understanding about the price increases, which is it's a it's a funny it's a funny conundrum, I guess, just because once you present and they know that they're getting fantastic value and you've got that customer already, it's a lot easier to raise prices. Uh, it's uh, Stephen. I used to work for for Tag Group also, mm. and I remember Paul Goldstein always told me when we opened I opened Lavo. And he told me it's a, it's a lot easier to raise prices in a full dining room. So when, when anybody was opening, they would open with kind of low prices. And once you sell it and you like blow it out the water and it's amazing and it's packed, you can raise prices a little bit because you already have that customer base. You already have those people and you can tell them straight, like, listen, you know, our costs are going up, unfortunately. And they're like, oh yeah, the pandemic. Oh yeah, no, I have a business too. I understand. So we, we have that when you already have the people, it's a little bit easier to raise prices when you're selling it for the first time, it's a little harder to kind of give that price, but that's our, 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 you know, our experience. Okay. Okay. Uh, audience, any Larry, questions? Can, can I butt in a little bit? Um, I okay. haven't been in my restaurant. I haven't had a restaurant in many, many years. I'm now working with CPGs. Uh, price equals value. So if you educate your consumer to understand your value, Yvonne, uh, Bree, you, Stephen, you all spoke about the value that you're providing. People will pay the price if you can show them why the value is there. I'm using uh, only local tomatoes. I'm doing... Um, you know, you said Berkshire pork. That's that's really what the whole issue is. And I see it on the other end, which is that we have artisanal food makers at the incubator who are selling a jar of jam for $20. People are going, oh my God. But they're telling them why it's costing that much. You know, and that really is what it's all about throughout anything that we do, whether we own a restaurant it's also with the staffing what is the value you're giving your staff the education learning new things you know can i give you more money no i can't give you more money but i can give you a birthday party <laughs> whatever so this is this is all where we're heading and i see it so much in all of the industries as the education of the consumer letting them understand what we're facing and how we're going to work with them and give them the best experience. You don't have a lot of staff. Well, you know, we'll give you, maybe we'll cut down the hours. Maybe we won't have that many tables in our restaurant. We'll do whatever we have to make sure that you have a great experience. Bree, you go around and talk to people. That's, that makes a big difference. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And also, like, if, if I could say one last thing, at the end of the day, like the, the restaurant experience, it really is an experience. Like, as a chef myself, like, it's hard for me to understand that food is very important. But sometimes it's not the most important thing in a restaurant. You know, if you would very happily go to a place that makes you feel great, where the customer service is great, where it looks kind of pretty, and the food is good, it doesn't have to be exceptional, just good. Like, but you won't go to a place where the food is phenomenal and they treat you like crap. Yeah, it, That's it's bottom line. No question. As a diner, as a diner, that's that's the thing. There has been many times that we, you know, Mona and I have spent one hundred and seventy five dollars and we were happy leaving because it was a great experience. Mm -hmm. And there were times that we spent fifty dollars that we thought it was a ripoff. 
yeah. because you know maybe the food was thrown on the table it didn't come out the way we wanted it. It, it it's that experience and i remember the first time i went to a restaurant another place in mamaroneck and when we walked in the first time the one of the owners greeted us and he you know he said he had our last name and had my name asked mona her name and he said by the time you leave i will know both of you i will know both of you and the next time you come i will greet you by your first names and sure enough this guy did and it, it became it wasn't like going you know it was like going to cheers where you walk in and everybody goes norm it, it's that great feeling that you get in certain places that make you feel like they're really happy to see you. We keep you. And then there are places where, you know, you can't understand the person you're talking to. can't find your name. She doesn't know how to do this. You go to a table, the bread, the menus, nothing shows up. It's a completely different story. Okay. Um, Catherine, come on back in for a second. Okay. Now, what, what Catherine does is she trains people, and, and stop me if I'm wrong, because I just have this in capsule form. There are people who want to open a restaurant, who people who are, want to make that jump from home cook or cooking, you know, may have a concept that they think they can make a restaurant. And Catherine actually helps bridge the gap from cooking in your kitchen to doing professional work. Am I right on that? Close. What I have is a large 6,000 square foot commercial kitchen that I rent out to home cooks. I take them from their home cooking and I bring them into a commercial setting. I make sure they're licensed, they're inspected, they're everything. They have to be up to code. And then I start teaching them how to use the 80 quart mixer, not a five quart mixer, how to bake you know, uh, 40 dozen cookies, not four dozen. And I teach them how to um, market what they have to look at, where they should be going. And right now, the incubator in Long Island City has about 75 artisanal food manufacturers. We also have a lot of people who are home cooking and are selling at the marketplaces, uh, Schmorg, um, Urban Space, all of them. So we, you know, like take them step by step to go through it. So I have a question for you. Mm -hmm. You're teaching them all the technical basics here, but are you also teaching them how to communicate? We're back to this communication. What are the basics that you're teaching and how to get their word there? their ideas across to the people, the consumer, the consumer, that, well, that bridge that, you know, that Yvonne spoke about and Stephen spoke about it. And so did Bree. What are you teaching as basics of communication with a future customer? Well, that's the marketing and branding that they have to learn to do. Okay. Everybody is marketing, whether you're selling a jar of jam or you're selling dumplings and you eventually want to own your own restaurant. Uh, how are you explaining the food? How are you explaining why you cook something the way you're cooking? Why do you create this? You know, I'm using Indian spices because I just love, you know, I love them and they enhance the flavor and they do this. So it is the marketing and that's part of what they all have to learn. But then to also talk about the staff, teaching their staff, all of them come in without any staff. And then they little by little start hiring staff to help them. And none of the people, none of the clients in my kitchen work seven days a week there. Because at that point, they would have their own restaurant or their own uh, manufacturing plant. They work two or three days, so they have part-time staff, and we kind of slowly guide them. Um, they ask a question. We kind of teach them how to teach their staff. I always have staff, my own staff, there throughout the entire shift whenever anybody's working who's teaching them how to use their machine. I've worked with my staff to show them how to use this machine or how to do something or how. And then I said, you, I want you to teach 
the business owner. I want you to help them teach their staff. So it's a process of taking my staff and making them an educator, shall we say. So let me break in again on this. So, okay, and Bree, I'm going to go right to you in this thing. So let's not talk to a panel of consumers now. Let's talk to the restaurateurs who have lost their way, who are too involved with grabbing an extra penny and forgetting that somebody is paying them on the other side. And I know Yvonne and Stephen and, and, and Bree take care of their guests like their family, uh, okay. their family. So how do you, if you were to say something to these restaurateurs, we just had Catherine talk about the basics. How do you get these people back to the basics so that they can rebuild why people came to them the first time. Bree. Enthusiasm. I, 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 Mark and I are so passionate about what we do and you can't, you can't convey that to people if you are sitting in a meeting and being displacent and saying, same thing as yesterday, it's another scallop, it's another salad, if you don't know by now, like, if you don't, are, if you're not passionate about what you're doing, how can they be? Like, so you have to continually be passionate about what you are. And if you're not, you shouldn't, you shouldn't be here. Like, I, I just, uh, just the enthusiasm bleeds through into the staff. And, and exactly like you said, when you uh, allow people to teach other people, they become enthusiastic about it. Like they get to, to tell other people about it. Um, and not only their, their guests, I know I'm front of house and we might be talking about more back of house, but when, when you get to teach, like it's, it's really like thrilling. And you learn more about yourself and about what you know and about what you don't know. And if somebody comes to me and says, hypothetically, like, you know, like, well, what is this spice? And I'm like, oh, you know what? Let's find out together. Um, then I have to learn about it a little bit more and then I can teach them. And then we both learn something and then we can pass it down to everybody else. Um, but I don't know if that makes any sense, but. Much, a, a, a ton of sense, a ton of sense, Stephen. A few months back, we did it. We did a virtual breakfast session, you and Rocco, and I forgot who the third person was. And we were talking about the one mm. thing, the one thing that, oh, I mean, it was Stratus, I think, yeah. was the third guy. And uh, the one thing that your restaurant can't do without. And you started it off and just turned the whole thing on its ear. You said if it was an ingredient, it would be salt. But if it's my restaurant, it's leadership, leadership. And I, this is why you go from one successful place to another successful place. Talk a little bit about leadership and how, you know, we've got enthusiasm and now leadership. How do we deal with that? Um, sure. I mean, how many times have you heard, especially for chefs, that you have people like, oh, you know, it's a great team. They just need leadership. Right. I've heard that time after time from consulting gigs to friends that own restaurants or it doesn't matter. You know, you hear that all the time. Like it's a great team. They just need leadership. Right. And there are there are plenty of people that I've met that just want to be in the mix. They I had a uh, he was my corporate exec sous chef. We got him a job as a corporate sous chef for another company. I said, hey, it's time for you to fly and grow and about a year and a half later, he came back and said, you know, I, I did it. I gave it my all and I was successful, but I found out it wasn't for me. He's like, I want to come back and work for you. Um, and I said, okay, and that's, that's not a problem. It was, it was great. You gave it your all. And I think to have, you know, yeah, there are in the kitchen, you find a lot, a lot, a lot of alphas, right? A lot of shell chefs are very, very, demanding some are great leaders some are terrible leaders right and it it really comes down to yes leadership can be learned it 100 can be learned there yes there are natural born leaders 
but there's everything from self-help books to courses to business. You know, there's, there's a lot of things that you, but I think in my opinion, the number one thing you need to do is look at yourself and say, can I learn from my own mistakes? You know, that makes a good leader. If, if you can't learn from your own mistakes, then you're not willing to grow and you're not willing to acknowledge that mistake. Um, in my opinion, you can't, you can't ever be a great leader is when you, you know, you can't say, yes, I made a mistake. I'm willing to correct my mistake and say that to whether it be your staff, a disgruntled guest. Um, you know, I, it's, it's really, you have to be able to humble yourself and allow, allow yourself a little humility. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yvonne, Yvonne, why don't you pick up on this? So we've got, we've got, we have enthusiasm, we have leadership. What's the third key to running a great place? I don't know. It's, I'm trying to give it one or, or give you one thing, but it, it's, it, I think it's difficult to kind of verbalize. And I think it, it all really starts with like the, the, the leader, I guess. Like we were talking about leadership and, and enthusiasm and all these things, but like, I think we've all worked for people that are the number one person in whether it's a restaurant, a company or whatever it is. And you have a great team as they were saying, but they don't have the leadership. But I, I think it really starts at the top, you know, fortunately or unfortunately, I've been very fortunate to work for some really great companies that, you know, you give it your all and we build an awesome team and we have amazing openings but once you get to like a certain place and you realize like who you're, who you're working for, I guess, you really start to question things. And I remember I, I read this somewhere, like, uh, I don't know, some years ago. And it was like, if you're, if you're in a company or if you're in, in whatever, like a restaurant and you're really working your butt off, look at your boss and then look at your boss's boss and then look at your boss's boss's boss and realize, are they happy? Are they good people? Like that's what it really comes down to because everything trickles down and you can work your butt off as much as you want. But if you're not doing it for the right reasons or for the right people, at the end of the day, you're going to feel very unfulfilled and you're going to just quit. That's like, look at the top people who are leading the company of those people. Do those people have vision and are they good people? Like how are their morals? Do they match what you want? Like, do you want to be that in 10, 15, 20 years? Is that where you want to go? And if that's the key, and if you can say yes to all that, then you're in the right place. And if you're not, then you should quit and go do your own thing. As hard as it is, it is better. It is better to build slow and long with the right people. Because in 20 years, you're going to look back and you're going to say, shit. That's my two cents. Okay, I don't know if I could put that in the magazine. Fred, can we put that in the paper? That quote. <laughs> well, it's that time. It's that time, folks. We've got to start wrapping it up. So what I want to do, and, and by the way, first of all, I want to thank everybody that spent some time with us today. Ed, uh, we really appreciate it. But before we start saying goodbye, I'd like everyone uh, on the panel here, including you, Catherine, because we, we put you in big lights now. Um, I'd like to go around the room and please give one last thought that you'd like to leave with people, something that'll stick in their mind. Uh, one last tip, one last thought, one last thing to look for when, when you go to a restaurant. Um, Stephen, why don't you start? Um, my I love getting outside of my comfort zone, which I get burned a lot on. Um, if it's a, if it's a new restaurant or a new cuisine or, you know, I, I love trying new things. The way, the way I look at my life is, you know, one of those old video games where the whole map is black and unless you go, you know, explore, it's going to stay that way. Right. So that in the same way for, for food, if it's, it could be like, I live in Astoria and there's a lot of Greek food, but there's also a lot of Eastern European food. Um, that I didn't, you know, grow up eating. So it's trying out new things and learn, and you learn so much about their culture uh, through food. And I think that's the easiest way to gap into a connection with someone is to learn, you know, through their food. So I would say trying, trying new things, getting out, getting out of your comfort zone. If you eat 
you know, Chinese food every single night, you're never going to know uh, what's on the other side. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Bree. Well, he just stole mine. That's not oh, fair. No. <laughs> 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 my, my whole skill is like, just trust me. Like when it, what, the worst case scenario is you learn something that you love or, or you learn something that you don't like something. Um, but I guess, um, I don't know if we're talking about diners, but uh, anybody whatever, pick, pick somebody. Yeah, just be compassionate for the other side. Um, what, whether you're, you know, like you don't know what other people are going through. So let's just be kind to each other. Mm -hmm. That's it. Catherine, unmute. Give us one last point to remember. I want to share whatever information I know and I've learned. Okay. My mission is to educate the world, educate my clients uh, in the kitchen, educate diners, educate the general public. So it's the sharing of information. I don't feel that I should keep this information to myself. I don't feel that that's what it's about. And hopefully it comes across and, you know, people realize that I'm not, you know, I'm not in it just for me. I'm in it for the bigger picture. Okay. Thank you. Yvonne. I mean, just leading by support local, like support small, support local, uh, family owned restaurants, uh, family owned businesses, small places that, that benefit your community. I think it, at the end of the day, wherever you, you live, is is really a reflection of the people that you're surrounded by and i think a lot of times we forget that in order for you to to have a good life to live your in your family your kids and your environment to be positive and exactly what you want it to be you have to you have to plant those seeds all around you so support locals support small okay. I think. thank you fred Great session, really interesting. Uh, you know, I've been writing an awful lot about robots lately and about technology. Yeah. And I think what you realize is, at least right now where we are, it's still all about the people at all levels yeah. and, and how people teach and how people relate. Yeah. Especially Great in session. the restaurant Thanks. business, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's, 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 it's interesting, you know. Uh, <laughs> Once again, I, I, you know, we do this show each time to highlight the knowledge that people bring with them to this. Uh, I think, though, the, the, my favorite quote is from Dale Willard. Fred, you know Dale. Yeah, sure. Dale had been, a, when we first started doing the virtual breakfast session, Dale had come on uh, a few times to help us out because, you know, none of us knew what we were doing. And... Um, Dale said to me one time, you know, I come on this show to inform people, to let people impart my knowledge. But every time I go home learning something and I, I thank all of you for, for sharing that knowledge with myself and, and strangers in the audience, strangers in the audience, because the things that you find every day as something that you do just because that's what you do can be new to me, could be new to five people here and they go, Hey, that's a good idea. And they can, they can change that to fit their daily routine. So once again, I thank you all for spending time with us. Um, we're going to be back in a couple weeks and I'll, uh, if you check out uh, Eventbrite or LinkedIn, you'll be able to see where we're going to be and what we're going to be doing. Um, I, I don't try to pull things out of my memory because I don't own one anymore. And uh, so please check us out on Eventbrite. Check us out on LinkedIn. It's going to be another show. I know in a few weeks coming up, we're going to be speaking to Peter Herrero doing a coffee with. I don't know if that's the next show or the show after. But if, you know, if so, whenever you see his name up there, come. This is a guy who has been on many of our shows. And we're going to do a 
one on one with him and to really crawl into that uh, that complicated head he's got that turns out great hospitality. So once again, we're down to my last two wishes for everybody. To everybody, please. I have a delivery. Stay positive, test negative, and we'll see you in two weeks. Bye now, folks. Have a great day, everyone. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Have a good service. Thank Bye. you.